ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد it is very natural feeling uh, uh, it is very natural i'm sorry to hate anyone who opposes the sunnah or it is a very natural feeling to hate someone who opposes the sunnah and the hadith of allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam in fact the one who does not hate the opposer of the sunnah is abnormal he's got a problem and his faith is weak and shabby it's not really good is it loving what allah loves and hating what allah hates a foundation foundational principle in our deen it is loving what allah loves hating what allah hates is part and parcel of our deen i will quote some narrations to support that because some people think you're being extreme because what they prefer is love you should love everyone irrespective of their religion their faith their obedience or disobedience everyone deserves some love and that is incorrect and i will prove it to you from the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the hadith which was collected by at tirmidhi hadith of muadh ibn anas radiyallahu anhu authenticated by sheikh al-albani it's a long hadith not really long but the part which i will quote is من أعطى لله وأحب لله وأبغض لله فقد استكمل الإيمان. Whosoever gives for the sake of Allah, loves for the sake for the sake of Allah, and hates for the sake of Allah, has completed his faith, has perfected his faith. I mean, faith will not be perfect until you give for the sake of Allah, with hope for the sake of Allah, love for the sake of Allah, and hate for the sake of Allah. In the Hadith of Barab Nazib. Uh, which is in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, also authenticated by Sheikh Al-Albani rahimahullah. He said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, awthaqa ura al-iman al-hubbu fi Allah wa al-bughdu fi Allah. The strongest aspect of your faith is loving for the sake of Allah and hating for the sake of Allah. The strongest thing which you hold on to. فَقَدْ اسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُوَّةِ الْوُثْقَى awthaqa ura al-iman. The strongest thing you hold on to is loving for the sake of Allah and hating for the sake of Allah. Shaykh al-Zalim ibn Tayyib rahimahullah said, إِنَّ تَحْقِيقَ شَهَادَةَ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ يَقْتَدِي أَنْ يُحِبَّ أَنْ لَا يُحِبَّ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ وَلَا يُبْغِدْ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ وَلَا يُعَادِي إِلَّا لِلَّهِ وَلَا يُوَادْ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ وَأَنْ يُحِبَّ مَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ وَيُبْغِدُ مَا أَبْغَضَ اللَّهِ فِي مَجْمُعِ الْفَتَاوَى of your declaration of la ilaha illallah is that you do not love anything except for the sake of Allah nor do you hate anything except for the sake of Allah nor do you show affection to anyone except for the sake of Allah nor do you show hatred towards anyone except for the sake of Allah and that you love what Allah loves and you hate what Allah hates and Ibn Abbas radiallahu has said something along the same lines before as well meaning this was something established Loving for the sake of Allah, hating for the sake of Allah. So, and what, is it, what does it mean? You love what Allah loves and you hate what Allah hates. So when Allah says in the Quran, He hates such and such and such and such, you have to hate them as well. Now, if someone combines good and bad, some say you love the person and you hate their action, no. Rather, you hate them according to the evil which they are upon. And you love them according to the good which they are upon. It's not about you cannot love someone and hate their action. Because that means that you will not treat them differently because you have love all the time. And you hate their deed. Well, you can't deal with their deed. It's not like their deed is a separate entity which you can, you know, box with. Whatever they're doing is, well, you can't deal with it. What you can deal is with the doer. So this idea that people say, don't hate the person, hate the action, is also incorrect. Rather, hate the person according to his 
disobedience and opposition to the sunnah and love them according to the good. Obviously, no one is perfect. So we have to be balanced also. Can't hate someone all the way because of some sin they commit. And you can't love someone all the way if they go against the sunnah. It must be according to what is pleasing to Allah wa ta'ala. So if someone, if one of us has an issue with this principle that I just mentioned, let him blame himself. Don't blame and don't have issues with the ones who live by it. Don't have problems with the one who loves for the sake of Allah or the one who loves what Allah loves and hates what Allah hates. If you don't feel this strong, blame yourself for your shortcomings. But don't think that someone who is adhering to the religion in this fashion is a fundamentalist or an extremist. He's not. He's following the teachings of our righteous predecessors. We say we have a problem. We haven't reached that level of faith where we're able to love what Allah loves and hate what Allah hates. Because some people love those who Allah hates. I mean, we know already Allah hates the arrogant and He hates the prideful and He hates the, you know, the mutakabbir. He hates a number of people that Allah mentioned in the Quran, the disbelievers. So how can we love someone whom Allah Azza wa Jal hates? Unless the Iman is weak, it is not possible. If the Iman is sound, then it is possible. It has to do with our Iman. Now, what I was referring to earlier was the hatred for someone who opposes the Sunnah in some regards, who opposes the sunnah, or engages in sins or innovations. How would we feel then about someone who denies the sunnah altogether? Someone who denies the sunnah altogether and does not believe in its authority. Did you know that these people exist? Yes. And they are called Al-Qur'aniyun. Sometimes Al-Qur'aniyin, depending on where it comes in the sentence. Quranites, or they call themselves Ahlul Quran. Supposedly, they are the people who follow the Quran. And you, you, some people think that you know we're talking about you know some some minority you know somewhere living on on, on Jupiter, and that we're not really in, in contact with them. Then think again. These creatures are around. They are around. I've come across them myself personally in my short lifespan. I'm not 80 years old, not yet at least, alhamdulillah. In this short lifespan, I've come across plenty. Plenty. This is life, life contact. Don't ask about now through the YouTube comments and the Facebook and the email and all the modern means of communication. Then you're in contact now with people all over the world and you hear the amazing, amazing accusations, allegations and lies of these people. I remember when one guy was wearing a golden ring and he was advised not to wear it. And he said, show me where it is in the Quran. Show me an ayah which says that wearing gold rings is haram for men, I will take it off. If you can't bring it, then I'm not going to take it off because it's not haram. Say, yeah, but the Messenger of Allah said, so no, 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 no. I said, show me in the Quran. Yep. These people have websites. Don't go there. Don't go there. And I must make this a point. You have to understand that the shaitan is ever chasing you. Ever chasing you. And the uh, two paths from which he can attack you is either your desires, shahawat, or shubuhat, doubt by casting doubt. And if you're not fortified with knowledge, if you're not firm, if you don't have certainty concerning the subject matters, if you expose yourself to some of the doubts, you may be the first victim. You may be the first victim. And this happened many times. People said, oh, brother, I was you know, debating with the Shia, and then they told me something which I can't answer. So can you please explain? Well, I don't have to. What were you doing there to begin with? If you're not qualified to be debating with them, then you shouldn't be there. Because if they turn the tables around and they cast it out and no one is able to answer it for you, what's going to happen? This will remain with you, Allah knows how long, and it may be the reason why you become a Shia and leave the Sunnah. This happens all the time. So when I speak about them, don't go get too curious right now and go look them up online. Because they may cast some doubt. And if Al-Bayan fi Sihr, 
in, in, in speech, in the, the eloquence of people, there's magic. They will give you evidences which, are, which make it seem like they're upon something. And if you don't know the refutations, you will get lost. But the websites are there by the hundreds calling to the same ideology. So let us go back to the dictionary. What does philosopher or philosophy mean according to the dictionary? I'll give you two definitions. There are maybe a lot more, maybe around eight usually, the eight main definitions. But I'll give you two to show you why the Quranites or these Qurani people, uh, the actual term or the noun philosophy applies to them, philosophers. It says philosophy is the investigation of knowledge based on logical reasoning rather than empirical verifiable methods. Again, investigation of knowledge, to investigate knowledge, based on what? Logical, Log logical reasoning, rather than empirical methods. Empirical means verifiable. Meaning they're not going back to the textual evidences, no. They will evaluate it according to their reasoning, even though they have no reason whatsoever. And according to what they say, this is their opinion, this is their philosophy. And if we understand it like this, they're basically turning around, turning away from the revelation and imposing their mind on what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Subsequently, they become philosophers. The other definition, it says, a personal outlook or viewpoint. And that's exactly what it is. Denying the Sunnah is nothing more than their personal outlook and viewpoint. Their philosophical understanding of the revelation which is rejected in Islam. It's rejected in Islam. Now, these wicked creatures have hundreds of websites like I told you earlier and great numbers of followers. It's not a minority. They claim to, and they say in the website, we follow the Quran. No more, no less. Wow, isn't that an attractive slogan? We follow the Quran. No more, no less. Is that acceptable, ya akhwan? Can you say you follow the Quran, no more, no less? La ilaha illallah. Everybody has a refutation, but let's listen to what the ulama have to say concerning this. The sunnah to them is unreliable. It is not a reference. You know what's amazing? That this is a prophecy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He foretold this per Allah's revelation to him, obviously, 1400 years ago. In an authentic narration, he said, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, the hadith is the hadith of Maqdam, it's in Al Hakim al Tirmidhi and Ibn Majad, Sahih. He said, Yushiku ahadukum ayyu kadhibani. وهو متكئ يحدث بحديث فيقول بيننا وبينكم كتاب الله كتاب الله فما وجدنا فيه من حلال استحللناه وما وجدنا فيه من حرام حرمناه ألا إنما حرم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم مثل ما حرم الله The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said soon one of you will be lying while he is reclining on his couch يُحَدَّثُ بِحَدِيثِ Someone will quote to him my narration. Someone will narrate unto him my narration. And he will say to you, between us and you is the book of Allah. Whatever you find halal in there, we will make it halal. And whatever you find haram in there, we will make it haram. Then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa refuted by saying, Verily, whatever the Messenger of Allah made haram uh, is equal to what Allah made haram. What the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made haram is equal, even is the same like what Allah made haram. This is a prophecy. Soon this person will come, he will say, Yushik, yani from the time is not going to be too long. Say, well, you know, I don't know. Between us is the book of Allah. And so you find that according to them, half of the deed is gone, if not more. How are you going to pray? How are you going to fast? I get to pay zakah. How will you perform hajj? How will you perform umrah? How? 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 What about the rulings which you learn from the sunnah? All the teachings for men and women which we learn from the sunnah. The behavior of the Prophet which we learn from the sunnah. The treatment of the wives, the rights of the children. The, half, the whole deen 
comes from the general explanation of the Quran, the specific explanation of the Sunnah of the general teaching in the Quran. So to claim that there is no such thing is outrageous and it leaves you with nothing. It leaves you with nothing. And furthermore, they believe that the Quran is not someone's, it's not the right of some people to do tafsir. No, no, anyone can do tafsir. Anyone, if you can write the Quran and deduce your own rulings and act upon it, because supposedly the Quran is this for everyone. So there's no, they don't make that distinction between the knowledgeable and the ignorant. Everything goes. With no sunnah, there's no more Islam. Now, you may wonder where did they come from? They were a minority of them. Some of them say it was the Khawarij, some say it was the Mu'tazila. At the time of Imam Shafi, rahimahullah, in the second century, a very minority, Imam Shafi refuted them and they died out. They died out until uh, a couple of hundred years ago, uh, the, the 1900s, in the colonization of uh, the British, the British colonization to the Indian subcontinent. Basically, they took over that, that area. And uh, of course, the Hindus and the Christians, everybody else had no problem in going along with everything that the British were imposing. The only ones whom they found resistance amongst and, and they were, you know, persevered, they persevered, were the Muslims, as usual. The Muslims were willing to give up their deen for the British, you know, uh, imposing on them whatever values and views and what have you that contradicted the teachings of Islam. And so, there's this, you know, very, you know, uh, effective, but dangerous uh, concept called, if you can't beat them, join them. And it works. It works every single time. Anywhere you go, until today, it works. If you can't beat them, join them. Go inside and destroy them from within. Just like Paul did to Christianity. He couldn't beat them. I mean, he was, he was torturing them, but he can't torture a whole nation. He can't torture a whole you know, the whole adherence of Christianity. So suddenly he became, you know, the apostle uh, uh, Paul and suddenly he saw Jesus and suddenly there's a new concept in Christianity other than the one that Jesus taught. So God became his son and incarnation and he became one of three in the father. All these things came uh, partially, partially because of Paul's claim. The same thing that Abdullah ibn Saba, the, the, the Jewish uh, hypocrite, who also entered into Islam with the intention to destroy Islam from within. It's the same idea. You can't beat them, join them. So they did the same thing. And from them came Sayyid Ahmad Khan, the wicked. And from them came uh, Ghulam Ahmad and the Qadianis. And from them came Rashad Khalifa. And all these people who pushed this idea of t putting away the Sunnah and supposedly sticking to the Quran. So they are the ones who revived this uh, ideology and then of course in Egypt they picked up on it and then they were propagators in Egypt as well among the Arabs and so now you have among the Arabs and the non-Arabs people pushing for this idea that all you need in your life is the Quran the Sunnah is unreliable subsequently you cannot refer to it and so Islam became the Quran only and there was no more Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what are their beliefs? The first thing they say, which is crazy, is that there's no such thing as naskh. There's no such thing as abrogation. Now look at the contradiction and the hypocrisy. They say we follow the Quran only, and the Quran says, ما ننسخ من آية أو ننسها نأتي بخير منها أو مثلها. We don't abrogate an ayah, nor do we cause it to be forgotten, except that we bring one which is better than it or like it. So in the very text of the Quran, Allah has just spoke about the abrogation of ayat, abrogating others. But according to them, there is no such thing as abrogation. And we know that there is. Because otherwise, if there is no such thing as abrogation, you can go get out of this hall and get drunk. You know that? Because in the beginning, the ayat about Khamar were not that of prohibition. And there are ayat in the Quran which actually say that don't go pray. Don't go pray while you are intoxicated until you know what you're saying. So if someone doesn't believe the last ayah, which is فَالْأَنْتُمْ مِنْتَهُونَ مُنْتَهُونَ Abrogated the, pre the previous one, then it remains effective that you can still get drunk. And the list goes on and on and on. 
So the dangers of, of denying abrogation is outrageous. And they claim that there's no such thing but it's in the Quran. So that tells you how much of the Quran they're following. But that's not the worst thing. The worst thing is they say the Sunnah is not authoritative. The Sunnah is not authoritative. Fine. So then how do we understand the following? How do we understand the statement of Allah? وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ Whatever the messenger gives you, take it. And whatever he forbids you, leave it alone. Desist. Stop. And fear Allah very Allah is severe in punishment. Time out. If the sunnah was not authoritative, then how would you apply what whatever the messenger gives you, take it. Because if they claim that whatever the messenger gave was the Quran only, then the ayah wouldn't make sense. The ayah wouldn't be in this form. It would be whatever is in the Quran, take it. Whatever is not, leave it alone. No. But the ayah says whatever the messenger gives you, whatever he forbids you. Where are you going to know what he gave and forbade? Because what's in the Quran is what Allah gave and forbade, not the messenger of Allah. Is it? Yes. In the Quran is what Allah said, do and don't. But the messengers, his do's and don'ts, where are you going to get it from? The sunnah. So how will you then follow, how will you claim that the sunnah is not authoritative and apply this ayah? This ayah becomes meaningless and void. But that, not only this ayah. How would you apply the ayah of Akhtaraftum fihi min shayt faruddu ila Allahi wal Rasul? Whatever you differ concerning, then return it to Allah and His Messenger. Now we know returning it to Allah is returning it to what? The Book of Allah. Isn't it? Okay, how would you return it to the Messenger of Allah? How would you apply this ayah? Ayah number three. Allah says, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَوَدُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَعَصَوُوا الرَّسُولَ لَوْ تُسَوَّى بِهِمُ الْأَرْضِ وَلَا يَكْتُمُونَ اللَّهَ حَدِيثًا On that day, those who disbelieved and disobeyed the messenger will wish that they were buried in the earth, but they will never be able to hide a single fact from Allah. How will this ayah apply? How did they disobey the messenger? How did they disobey? Because disbelief, we know they rejected the Qur'an. How did they do the nasi of the Rasul? It is impossible if there wasn't a sunnah. Fourthly, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul wa uli al-amri minkum. Oh, you have believed, obey Allah and obey His Messenger. Obeying Allah, or we obey the Quran. Obey the Messenger is how? If they say it's also obeying the Quran, that's redundant. That's redundant. It's repeating something for no benefit. Obey Allah, find the Quran. They say that obey the Messenger also means obey the Quran. Why? It doesn't make any sense. Now, fifthly, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْا إِلَى مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ وَإِلَى الرَّسُولِ رَأَيْتَ الْمُنَافِقِينَ يَصُدُّونَ عَنْكَ صُدُودًا And when it is said to them, come to what Allah has revealed and to the messenger, you see the hypocrites turning away from you in aversion. And that's exactly what these people are doing. When it said, come to Allah and His messenger, they, the hypocrites turn away. Meaning they don't want to go back to the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu because the hypocrites. FYI, the Quranites are kuffar. The scholars have no dispute about their kufur. There's no dispute about their disbelief. These people are speaking about, they're not Muslims. Not Muslims. Not Muslims. Not Muslims. Because all these ayat will become, will be, they're belying the ayat of the Quran. And we will see more. Don't get ahead of yourself. Furthermore, Allah says, And we have not sent a messenger except that he is to be obeyed by the permission of Allah. Meaning the messenger has to obey. How would you obey the messenger if there was no sunnah? Allah says, وَمَن يُطِعَ الرَّسُولَ فَقَدْ أَطَاعَ اللَّهِ Whosoever obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah. How would you understand this ayah if there was no sunnah? You see where I'm going. And lastly, Allah Azza wa Jal says, uh, no, uh, yeah. وَأَطِيعُ اللَّهُ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولُ وَحْذَرُوا 
فإن توليتم فعلموا أنما على رسولنا البلاغ المبين. Obey Allah and obey His Messenger and be careful. If you turn away, then verily upon the Messenger is the responsibility of the clear clarification only. And in Surah Al Surah Al Shu'ara, وقف الجناح كلمة التبعك من المؤمنين فإن عصوك فقل إني بريء مما تعملون. And lower your wing to those who follow you among the believers. And if they disobey you, say verily, I am innocent of whatever you are doing. So in Asawka, they disobey you. Meaning when you command them and they disobey you. Again, all of these would become ineffective. Anyways, Allah Azza wa Jal had already also prophesied and told us about, hinted at this by saying in the following ayah, Ya ayyuha rasul لا يحسنك الذين يسارعون في الكفر من الذين قالوا آمنا بأفواههم ولم تؤمن قلوبهم ومن الذين هادوا سمعون للكذب سمعون لقوم آخرين لم يأتوك يحرفون الكلمة عن بعض مواضعه يقولون إن أتيتم هذا فخذوه وإن لم تؤتوه فاحذروا ومن يرد الله فتنته فلن تملك له من الله شيئا أولئك الذين لم يرد الله أن يطهر قلوبهم لهم في لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب أليم. Listen to this ayah. O messenger, let them not grieve you who hasten into disbelief of those who say we believe with their mouths, but their hearts believe not. Nor and from among the Jews, also from among the Jews, they are avid listeners to falsehood. Listening to another people who have not come to you, they distort words beyond their proper usages, saying, If you are given this, take it. But if you are not given, then beware. But he for whom Allah intends fitna, pay attention, he for whom Allah intends fitna, never will you possess any power for him to do against Allah. No power for him to think against Allah. You can't do anything. If Allah intends to send someone astray, there's nothing which you can do to keep him upon the deen. Then Allah said, those are the ones for whom Allah does not intend to purify their hearts. And that's the scary part. That's the ulama say this is one of the scariest ayat. If Allah doesn't intend to purify our hearts, who will do it? No one. You can't do it on your own, your friends can't do it, your family can't do it, your wife can't do it, your husband can't do it, no one can do it. Allah is the one, Yuzakki may yasha. And if Allah doesn't want to purify our hearts, we are destroyed. This is why Salah is not, not a habit. It is not Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. It is not. Because if you don't mean what you're saying, then you're not going to get what you want. How is Allah going to purify your heart when you don't even know what you're saying in the Fatiha? The Fatiha is the source of purification. If you mean what you say in the Fatiha, you praise Allah and you mention His Majesty and you glorify Him and you praise Him. Then you mention that you need Him and you worship Him alone. Then you beg Him for guidance, the guidance of the righteous, and you tell Him to keep you from the path of the, those who are astray. This is a comprehensive dua, nothing better than that. 17 times a day minimum, 40 times on average if you pray the Sunnah. So if we were to think about that, that is enough for the purification of the heart. Because if Allah doesn't want to purify the heart, and if Allah wants to send someone astray with the fitna, He's done. This is why we have to be always begging Allah, be careful, be careful. Don't get carried away. We get carried away with our sins. We all do. But we have to be careful. We have to know when to stop. And when we fall into the sin, repent to Allah, change. Don't get comfortable. Don't get comfortable. Once you start sinning and you get comfortable with it and you no longer feel remorseful, then this is already, we're already going in the direction where the purification of the heart may become something absent. So it is very necessary that we are in Allah Yuhibbu Tawwabin. Allah loves those who constantly repent to Him. We all sin, the speaker and the listeners. But as long as we, we must always repent to Allah. If we don't, Akhwan, we are in big trouble. The ayah, this ayah is scary. For them in this world is disgrace. And in the, for them in the hereafter is a great, great punishment. So Allah is telling the Prophet don't grieve over these people who say they believe with their mouths and they really don't believe in their hearts. 
and they reject the things which come from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like the, these people and the Jews. Now, let us refute them. Let us refute them. These are the ayat I quoted to show you that according to them, these ayat become meaningless, ineffective, inapplicable, void, invalid. You name it. Think about the words. These ayat become nothing according to them because all of them necessitate obeying the messenger, returning to the messenger, listening to the messenger, one against disobeying the messenger, and the list goes on. If there was no sunnah, all of this wouldn't be there. It would have been call Allah and the Quran in its end. It's the end of it. But let us refute them. Shaykh al-Bani rahimahullah ta'ala wa atkhalahu fasiha jannatih wa askinahu al-firdas al-awla al-a'la rahimahullah the one who defended the sunnah with his life until he died sallallahu anhu we can say sallallahu anhu by the way wa rahimahullah because may Allah be pleased with them. Here in the go to the masjid if you give an old man something he says Allah yarda alayk. Same thing may Allah be pleased with you. I don't need it in any other way. Rahimahullah, he, you know the Shaykh. I'm not going to give you a bio of the Shaykh and introduce him. Everybody should be, anyone who loves the Sunnah should know of Shaykh al-Albani. Yet we say we're not blind followers of anyone. We're not Albanis, as in only Albani and nothing else goes. No. We still take from all the ulama which propagate and love the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. We don't have any blind or any uh, attachment to any particular one while withholding from the others or abandoning the others. Even though this is a quality and characteristic of some people today. They have three scholars that they take from today and everybody else can take a hike according to them. No one else is qualified, no one else is speed, no one else is that. This is extreme in our deen. We're not restricted to a few. Plenty of ulama upon the sunnah. Yes, those who made errors in some areas, we abandon the errors, no doubt. No doubt, not everyone is always perfect, no one. Not even the four imams of the hadai, obviously. Now we have our balance. Someone's upon the sunnah with some mistakes. Ignore the mistakes, take from him. Not he makes a mistake, alas, put a big old X on him, you know? He's done. It's the X list. He's off the manhaj, brother. Yes, he's off the manhaj. We'll see who's off the manhaj at the end of the day. Now, the Shaykh Rahimullah had a nice refutation to these people. He said, uh, quoting or commenting on the ayah, Allah says, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَى لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Remember this ayah, memorize it, understand it. Allah Azza wa Jal says, And we revealed to you the message. Listen carefully. We revealed to you the message. That you may make clear to the people what was sent down to them, and that they, may, they might give thought. Chapter 18, or Surah 16, Afwan, Ayah number 44. Believe Surah Al-Nahim. Listen. I will repeat. And we reveal to you the message that you may make clear to the people what was sent down to them. Now, what is the message which Allah sent? The Quran. And what? The Sunnah. The Quran, we know it already. Who will make clear to the people what's in the Quran through the Sunnah? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah said that we send down the Quran so that you may make clear to the people. According to them, the Quran is clear already. There is nothing which requires further clarification. If this is the case, then again this ayah cannot be understood. If the Quran was clear, then why did Allah say, so you may make clear to the people. So you can make clear to the people what you know Allah revealed. It wouldn't be necessary because according to them, it's already clear. Ajeeb. The Shaykh said, uh, this ayah consists of two types, the term litubayin. Litubayin uh, has explanation, so you may explain. The Shaykh said they, are, they consist of two types of explanation. First, an explanation of its wording and their arrangement. This means conveying the Quran and not concealing it, and persisting and present it to the people just as Allah revealed it to his heart. So here it means the Quran Shaykh, the first tafsir of Litubayin al nas meaning you convey the Quran as Allah revealed it unto you, in the order which we know it today. The order in which we know it today, the order of the Suwar, and the order of the Ayat in the Suwar, and the order of the words in the Ayat. All of them, this is part of the Tibyan of the Prophet to the Ummah. 
the second explanation of the meaning of the word of the sentence or the verse that the ummah needs an explain an explanation of the meaning of the word the meaning of the word or the sentence or the verse that the ummah needs to have explained this occurs a majority of the time with the ambiguous mujmal in arabic it's called mujmal ambiguous am general and mutlaq absolute the absolute verses we have uh, am we have uh, al mutlaq and we have al mujmal ayat in the quran so the sunnah came to clarify the ambiguous make specific the general and restrict the absolute the sunnah came to clarify the ambiguous make specific or specify the general and restrict the absolute the mutlaq examples allah says wasariqu wasariqatu faqta'u aydiyahuma the male and the female thief cut off their hands. Al yad. Now, this is Surah Al Ma'idah, Ayah 38. This is a good example here. The word thief, Sarat, if I put this tissue here, and one of the young kids came and took it, technically speaking, did he steal it or not? Yes. Is he a thief or not? Yes. It doesn't matter what you take. Linguistically, you have stolen something. Even if you, in fact, you can say to someone who's smoking, you stole my fresh air. I was breathing fresh air until you came, and you stole my fresh air which I was breathing. Technically speaking, linguistically. But, Islamically, is this the case? No. The Prophet وسلم, said in his verbal sunnah that there is no cutting off of the hand except in cases where one steals a quarter of a dinar or more. So this video which they were circulating uh, among the Christians, and I've received it many times from the Christians, they show you some people in Iran bringing a young seven-year-old child, more or less, and they have his arm under a truck. Okay? And they show you the truck running over his arm to chop it off. And they say because they caught him stealing an apple from the grocery store. The Christians. The Christians now. They say, look at Islam. This is Islam. Now according to Islam, this boy first is under the age of discretion. He is not reliable. Number two, he stole an apple. And that does not constitute a quarter of a dinar. Thirdly, you don't run it over with a truck to chop it off. Because you will take his whole arm. The sunnah specified that what you will cut off is from the wrist. From the wrist. And doing other than that is oppression. And the term aidi has different meanings. Because Fir'aun said, And according to some, it means he will chop off his, their whole arm. So the term yet can refer to the wrist, the arm, or even the palm. In Tayammum, Allah mentioned, And we know that the Sunnah is that you put some dust and you wipe your face. So here yet became palm. So here we have the term yet in the Quran, or the ruling on, on the thief. The Sunnah specified that it has to be a quarter of a dinar or more, and there are other conditions. The Ulama say, if it's something which you left out there, it doesn't count. It must be something which you hit somewhere and the thief went out of his way, broke into that thing and then stole it. If you left it, if you forgot your watch somewhere and someone took it, well, let's say still you don't cut, it, cut his hand. So the sunnah specified this. Without that, without that, if they don't want to refer to the sunnah, then all of the children, all of your children who probably stole something from someone's house, you'll be chopping hands all day. And Muslims will be walking out with no hands. You see these crazy people now? La ilaha illallah. They want to say that, you know, you can't go back to the sunnah, well you have to go back to the sunnah, otherwise how are you going to understand these ayat? I'll give you another example. And this one is scarier. 
Allah Azza wa Jal says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِيمَانَهُمْ بِظُلْمٍ أُولَئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمْنُ وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ Those who believe and do not mix their belief with injustice, ظلم is injustice, wrongdoing, oppression, those will have security and they are rightly guided. In the, in the ilm of tafsir, the ulama said is something called mafhum al-mukhalafa. Meaning when something is established, the opposite is also established without the need to be mentioned. So when Allah says, ulaika lahum lam, those will have security and they are rightly guided, it means those who don't, who mix ghul, they are ne neither do they have security nor are they rightly guided. And Allah doesn't have to say that. But when Allah says that those are like this, it means that the others are like that. Now when the Sahaba heard this ayah, they were troubled. They were troubled by the ayah. Allah said those who believe and they don't mix any injustice with their, with their iman. And those are the only ones who will have security, and those are the only ones who are rightly guided. So then, they went to the Messenger of Allah, they said, Oh Messenger of Allah, which one of us doesn't mix his faith with wrong? Here the Prophet wasallam said, it doesn't mean it. It doesn't mean this kind of ghul. It only means shirk. Did you not, did you not hear the statement of Luqman? Inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Very shirk is great dhul. So he's telling them this ayah here, the dhul which the ayah is referring to is like the dhul which Luqman was speaking about. The dhul, the dhul of shirk. The shirk is dhul, not the regular sins. Otherwise, according to this ayah, the whole Muslim woman is going to Jahannam. Because no one lived a perfect life from the time they reached puberty until they died. If once you mixed it with it, according to them, no heaven for you and you're not rightly guided. So it became necessary that the Prophet ﷺ explained the meaning of this ayah to the Sahaba. And Ibn Mas'ud said, they are the best of this ummah. He described the Sahaba saying they are the best of this ummah, possessing the most pious of hearts, profound in learning, and the least of constraints. But in spite of this, now this is Sheikh Al-Mani commenting, in spite of this, they erred. They made a mistake in understanding that, and it was necessary that the Prophet ﷺ gave him the correct meaning of the word dhulm in this ayah. So the Sunnah what? explains the Qur'an. It specifies that which is general. It explains what is ambiguous. The ayah was ambiguous. Dhulm could be interpreted in many different ways. Dhulm against yourself, dhulm against people, dhulm against the deen of Allah, dhulm against so on and so forth. It specified dhulm here was shirk. Meaning if you commit sins, it doesn't mean that you, are, you will not have security, nor does it mean that you're not rightly guided. So the sunnah again explained this ambiguous concept. Allah says, فَلَا وَرَبْ And there are many other examples. فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَدَيْتَ وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمًا And they, by your Lord, they shall never truly believe until they make you a judge concerning everything which they dispute about. Then they do not find within themselves any discomfort concerning your judgment and they submit in full submission. Allah said, you will not believe until you make the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the judge concerning everything. Meaning, you must refer back to the Sunnah. Because the Quran will not specify some things. And if you don't refer back to the Sunnah, you will never be able to find them out. Allah also says, وَمَا كَانَ لِي مُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَدَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَا يَعْصِ لَهَا وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدَّ اللَّهُ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا It is not for a believing man or a believing woman. After Allah and His Messenger have decided concerning a subject matter, have decided concerning any matter, that they should have an opinion concerning it. You're not even allowed to have an opinion once Allah or His Messenger declares something to be halal or haram. You don't even have the right of an opinion. And who, whoever disobeys Allah and His Messenger has went, you know, clearly astray. Clearly astray. This ayah, how will you understand it? Then furthermore, we have an ayah which we quoted earlier and listen to the incident related to it. وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ a woman came 
to Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. She said, are you the one who said, may Allah curse an nabisa wal mutanamisa wal washima wal mustawshima al akhiri? Are you the one who, you, who said, may Allah curse the woman who cuts her eyebrows and the one who gets them plucked, the one who does it and the one who gets it done, the one who does the tattoo and the one who gets it done and the list goes on. Are you the one who said that? She said, he said, yes. She said, I read the Quran from its front to its back. And I did not find that. I did not find that in what you say. I did not find in the Quran what you're saying. That Allah curses, you know, the Namisa and Mutanamisa. He responded, he said, if you have truly read it, you would have found it. Did you not read, وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَقُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَنْزَهُ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابُ She said, of course. He said, then I indeed heard the Messenger of Allah say, May Allah curse, may Allah's curse be upon the woman that plucks her eyebrows and the one who asked for it until the end. The hadith is reported by Bukhari and Muslim. Meaning Ibn Mas'ud was saying, look, the Messenger of Allah cursed. Allah said, generally obey Allah. Whatever the Messenger of Allah gives you, take it. Whatever He prohibits you, forbids you, leave it alone. Now, this is a practical application of his following of the Sunnah. Allah simply said, do that. And the Messenger of Allah said that, so I do what the Messenger of Allah did. He cursed them and I say, may Allah curse them. And we say, may Allah curse them. Because we do what, they, what the Prophet ﷺ told us to do. We follow him in all of these areas. Now, let us review them from the narrations. The Prophet ﷺ said, أَلَا إِنِّي أُوْتِيْتُ الْكِتَابِ وَمِثْلُهُ مَعَهُ Verily, I have been given the book and that which is equal to it with it. And this is the Sunnah, his Sunnah صلى الله عليه وسلم and this hadith صحيح Abu Dawood. Furthermore, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ أَطَاعَنِي فَقَدْ أَطَاعَ Whosoever obeys me has obeyed Allah. وَمَنْ عَصَانِي فَقَدْ عَصَى Allah. And whosoever disobeys me has disobeyed Allah. This is the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, and this is in Bukhari Muslim. In Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, كل أمتي يدخلون الجنة إلا من أبى قالوا وما يأبى يا رسول الله قال من أطاعني دخل الجنة ومن عصاني فقد أبى. He said, all of my Ummah will enter Jannah except those who disobey me. Except those who refuse, those who refuse or reject. He said, who will refuse or reject the Messenger of Allah? He said, whoever obeys me will enter Jannah, whoever disobeys me has rejected. Whoever disobeys me has refused. So these are narrations further fortifying the Quranic ayat about the harmony between obeying Allah and obeying His Messenger. Obeying Allah is following the Quran, obeying the Messenger is following the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which explains the Quran. Furthermore, Bukhari Muslim, he said in Hajjat al-Wada, in the final in the farewell pilgrimage, he said Alayhi Wasallam, فَلْيُبَلِّهُ الشَّاهِدِ الْغَائِبِ Let the one who is present convey this to the one who is absent. So he commanded them to convey his message, his speech to the people. Convey, he's commanded the people to convey his Sunnah because he was giving the khutbah. He was doing khutbah. And the khutbah was not all the ayat of the Quran. It was the ayat of the Quran with his own instructions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he commanded the people to convey it to the rest. So those who claim otherwise are simply wild. Now, but they say, they say, look, that's nice. But the sunnah, the hadith, we have problems with it. We have weak hadith, sahih hadith, Fabricate hadith for your own admission. You admit. We admit. So they say because of this doubt, because of the existence of this doubt, it is better to be safe and leave it alone. We say, wow, this is a very strange approach. And through which means do you think the Quran came to you? This Quran, wasn't it through the chain of narrators? It's the same as the analogy. It's the same methodology. How did you how did you get the Quran? Did Allah reveal a book? A physical book? No, he did not. If Allah revealed the book, then we will say, okay, you, the Quran has its own way of coming. The Quran and the Sunnah came through the same way. Except that in the beginning, the Messenger of Allah did not want the people to write his speech. Pay attention. 
In the beginning, he did not want the people to write, to write his speech. And this is one of the evidences they used. Now listen to this. And this is in Muslim, in the Sahih, in Sa'id Abu Sa'id al-Qudri. The Hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Qudri. The Prophet said, لا تكتبوا عني شيئاً إلا القرآن ومن كتب عني شيئاً فليمحي. He said, do not write anything from me except the Qur'an. And if you write anything other than that, erase it. Hadith what? Sahih. Do you believe it? We do. Do we deny it like they do? We don't. Now you know what's amazing? One of the funniest things in the world is that they use this hadith to claim that you don't have to believe in hadith. Live. <laughs> Majnoon. You must be Majnoon. If you, if you say that this hadith is sahih and you should go by his teaching, you just approved hadith. How do you deny it through the same source? It's absolutely crazy. But they go with it. And people don't pay attention. This is crazy. I mean, I thought of it logically. I thought I was intelligent, honestly. It turned out that I was not. I thought, I'm like, subhanAllah, do they really use this as a hujjah? Then I saw that Shaykh Al-Bari already used the same thing. Rahimahullah, of course, he's the Shaykh. He said the same thing to them. He said, look, if you are now acknowledging the authenticity of this narration, meaning you've acknowledged the science, how are you going to deny it from the same source? Your very approval of it is a refutation against you. If you want to deny it, you have to find something else. You can't find this narration. But even that narration has an explanation. Because we have other authentic narrations, listen to them. Hadith Abu Dawood and Al-Hakim and others. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, he said, قُلْتُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنِّي أَسْمَعُ مِنْكَ الشَّيْءِ فَأَكْتُبُهُ قَالَ نَعَمْ قُلْتُ فِي الْغَضَبُ وَالْرِضَى قَالَ نَعَمْ فَإِنِّي لَا أَقُولُ فِيهِمَا إِلَّا حَقًّا He said, O Messiah of Allah, I hear something from you, so I write it down. He said, yes. He said, whether in the state of anger or in the state of being pleased, he said, yes, nothing comes out in this regard except truth. Meaning whether I'm in the state of anger for the sake of Allah, because he never got angry for himself, or in the state of pleasure, in either case, nothing comes out of my mouth except حَقًّا وَمَا يَمْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيًا يُوحَى He does not speak of his own desire, it is nothing but revelation being revealed to him. That's one Sahih Hadith. At-Tirmidhi narrated from Hadith of Abu Hurairah. He said, كان رجل من الأنصار يجلس إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يسمع من الحديث فيعجبه ولا يحفظه يعني كان سريع النسيان فقال له النبي استعن عليه بيمينك وأوما بيده إلى الخط A man from the Ansar used to sit with the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم He would listen to the narration and he would like it but he, would, he wouldn't be able to memorize it meaning he didn't have a strong memory he would quickly forget so he said this, he said this to the Messenger of Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Ista'in alayhi biyaminik. Seek aid in the memorization with your right hand. And he gestured with the line, as in right. He gestured with the khat, right. With the khat, with the line, right. On a line. The second Sahih Hadith. The third Hadith. Uh, and the third Hadith, of course, now, uh, they want to play games with us, right? They say, but you know, you're quoting Hakim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, يعني, you, know, you know that this requires uh, verification, authentication. We say, no problem. You want Bukhari? Here comes Bukhari for you. Bukhari, narrated in the Sahih from Abu Hurairah, رضي الله عنه, said, لم يكن أحد من أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أكثر حديثا مني إلا ما كان من عبد الله بن عمر بن العاص فإنه كان يكتب وأنا لا أكتب He said رضي الله عنه No one from among the companions of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم had more collection of narrations than myself more than me except No one had more than me except عبد الله بن عمر بن العاص Very he used to write and I used to not write. He used to write. And earlier the Prophet said, write, nothing comes out except the truth, write. He commanded him to write. Abu Hurairah acknowledging that, uh, that he used to write, and do you think the Messenger of Allah will say to them, erase it, and they will keep it? 
Do you think Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As will be told by the Messenger of Allah, erase and he will keep it? Impossible. They kept it. They, 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 by the instruction of the Messenger of Allah. Why? The ulama say, look, the issue is not that complicated. Oh, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. One more hadith. Bukhari and Muslim. Bukhari and Muslim. أن رجلا من أهل اليمن اسمه أبو شاه سمع خطبة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بمبنى عام الفتح وكان أميا لا يقرأ ولا يكتب فطلب من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أن يكتب له شيئا مما قال فقال صلى الله عليه وسلم أصحابه اكتبوا لأبي شاه There was a man from the people of Yemen His name was Abu Shah He heard a خطبة of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم in the year of conquest in Mecca, he was illiterate, unlettered, he could neither read nor write. So he requested that the Messenger of Allah والسلام, write something for him. So the Prophet وسلم, said to Sahaba, write for Abu Shah. Write down for him, because he couldn't read or write. And the Prophet وسلم, couldn't read or write, والسلام, and that does not affect his, his, his greatness or his nobility والسلام, in any way, shape, or rather this is from the, from the evidences of his prophethood. Because he brought this Qur'an, which no one was able to even bring a surah like, while he wasn't able to read or write. I mean, he would assume someone who was reading encyclopedias day and night, and you know, looking, he would get some knowledge. Someone who couldn't read, and couldn't write, would be very much limited in his resources. Yet this Qur'an, who until today they can't deal with, this is a sign. This is a sign of his Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The hadith of Bukhari, Muslim Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, Sahaba, write for him. Right for him. He used to listen to the khutbah, he wanted to take some with him. So the ulama say, look, in the beginning, when the Qur'an was being revealed, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, did not want the mixture to occur. People were not yet familiar with the style of the Qur'an completely. They were not yet familiar. So there was fear that there would be mixture between what Allah said and what the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said. As the Iman grew among the Sahaba, and they were able to make a distinction now between the speech of Allah and the speech of the Messenger of Allah, he then commanded them to write because that is no longer an issue. So they obeyed and they wrote. This is the only thing that they have. They claim. Furthermore, Ya Khwan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has dedicated through his qabr and will and mashia that ulama dedicate their lives for the preservation, study, verification, and authentication of the science. If you read the biographies of the Imams who collected a hadith, beginning with Imam Shafi'i, Rahmallah, Imam Ahmed, Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, Nasa'i, Ibn Abi Shayba, Ila Akhi, you are amazed at the accuracy at the, 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 scru the, the scrutinization they were upon to ensure that everything is verified whether it is attributable to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or not. And when Allah said, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا ذِكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ Really it is we who send down the reminder and it is we who would protect it. This included the Quran and the Sunnah because today the Sunnah is protected. Now you try to find a quotation of any other prophet other than the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and say that I can attribute this to him, you are unable to do so. You can get the Bible and you can say that Jesus said, but can you, do you have a chain of narration or chain of narrators go back to Jesus? No way, Jose. But you can say that this hadith was narrated from Fulan who was thicker, fit, he was firm, he was reliable, excellent memory, pious, God-fearing, who narrated to this person, to that person, to that person that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and then this was collected and preserved in books which remain until today. This is how Allah Azza wa Jal preserved it. So this whole idea of the existence of weak narrations, of fabricated narrations, is only, it only supports our case to prove to them that the hadith has been preserved to the extent that we know what the Messenger of Allah said and what the people lied against him. Otherwise it would have been all mumbo jumbo. Everyone would come to say, no, 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 you can't come to this so the Messenger of Allah said, we will be able to tell whether this hadith or not, whether this is sahih or not. Can't we? Yes, we can. So they have absolutely no loopholes. 
They're trying to, you know, they're trying to fight like a snake. Trying to find just the small so they can go in and try to cause doubt. They can. Anytime they come in from a door, we will shut it in their face. You cannot be a Muslim without believing in the Quran and the Sunnah. And it is illogical, nonsensical to believe otherwise. To reject them. Let me tell you in conclusion what they want. Here's what they're aiming at. By the way, this is, this is pro-secular uh, or secularism. This, is, this actually supports the, the Western ideology of, of diminishing or destroying Islam. Yeah. If you can't join them, if you can't beat them, join them. So they actually, the modernists, they propagate this kind of ideology. They love it. Their aims and objectives is support of secularism and imposing it on the Muslims. You see this happening all over the place today. Secondly, support of the Shia. They support the Shia and the Sufis so that they will propagate falsehood and keep away the Muslims from the truth. And you wouldn't be shocked when Sheikh Nazim and Hamza Yusuf and all these people are on excellent terms with the governments which are killing the Muslims on daily basis. You wouldn't be shocked if they were totally fine with them. Because it's all part of the whole plan. These people are actually predominantly agents. And we will deal with other agents not too long from now. They actually support the Qadianis, the Ahmadis, with, with wealth and with you things you can't believe. So that they can continue to propagate their nonsense about the Prophet coming after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they use sometimes people of knowledge or so-called scholars whom they purchase with fulus. And these people come, you know, and they declare the nonsense before the masses. As it has happened many times with some of the shuyukh of the Azhar, you know, at some point they were calling for mixing, you know, in the Jama'at al-Azhar. Between them, well, everything goes. Even when you're studying the deen, let it be men and women sitting next to each other, like, you know, like, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Uh, and how do they do so? What will they lead to? They fight the niqab, which will eventually be, become denial of hijab. And we said already that those, those who say that hijab has nothing to do with the deen. They deny and put an end to many of the legal uh, for example, apostasy in Islam. When do you get the ruling on that from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? When they deny the Sunnah, they're able to deny struggling for the sake of Allah Jihad, they're able to deny the ruling on apostasy, they're able to deny the hijab of the woman, they're able to deny many, many different rulings will become of no value, become ineffective by simply denying the Sunnah. So once they see people with this kind of methodology and ideology, they will bring them, support them, give them masajid, give them places, give them websites, give them money, so that they will come and attack the Muslims with this nonsense. And this is why we have to be educated about these things, so we will not be fooled by these fools. So we can know our deen and know that it is intact, it is preserved, it is protected by Allah. No one, even if the people you know, propagate a modern approach, a modern understanding of Islam, we stick to the old ways. You know, as they say, we're old school. We are old school to the bone when it comes to Islam. Modern technology, guess what? We'll use microphones, videos, you know, recorders, whatever. In terms of the dunya, inshallah, we are up to date because we don't want to go far to get ahead while we are living behind. Now, we need to compete with them in these modern technologies for the da'wah of Islam. But when it comes to the deen, no, 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 Habibi. No, I will not adapt, adopt or adapt some, you know, brand new understanding of Islam by Maulana Batiqa, who they discovered a few years ago with this imama from here to Chinatown. They give him a big imama and give him a member to scream on, خلاص, this is Islam, la wallah. La, we will go back to way back. Way back. How they understood it, we will understand it. If the Sahaba lived for the Quran and the Sunnah, you better believe we will live for the Quran and the Sunnah. And we will never deny them. There were some statements of the Salaf which I wanted to quote to you, uh, just so we can end the lecture with them, just so you will know the position they were upon. You all know the incident of the Ridda, when the Prophet ﷺ died and the Arabs apost apostated. And then some of them said, we will not pay the zakah. You will not pay the zakah. And so uh, Abu Bakr said, Wallahi, I will fight them. I will fight them even if they prevent from me the Igal. 
which they used to in the Igal back then, it wasn't for for wearing it on the you know the shema. They used it to tie the camel's leg, so the camel would not be able to run away. Now it became a little more advanced. Uh, so uh, he said, I will not, I will not let them get away with the Igal. They used to pay to the Messenger of Allah. So Umar said, but how would you? He said, I will, I will fight anyone who divides between the salah and the zakah. I will fight anyone who divides between Salah and Zakah because Allah didn't divide between them. Umar said, but didn't the Messenger of Allah say, I was commanded to fight the people until they say, La ilaha illallah. But when they say they will protect their wealth and their, uh, their blood from me, illa bihaqiha, except bihaqiha, Allah, he said, verily that Zakah is from the haqq, from the do right of La ilaha illallah, then he made that statement. Again, using the Sunnah as authority. When Uthman said that you shouldn't do Umrah, to Hajj, and the news came to Ali, and he said that Uthman said that you shouldn't do that. Ishtihad from the from Khalif from the Khulafa Rashidin, Ali رضي الله عنه أهل بالعمرة والحج. After he heard that, he made it, it, يعني, uh, the, he entered into the state of ihram by doing ihram for Hajj and Umrah. He said that I will never leave the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah عليه وسلم for anyone. Even if it's Uthman, I will not leave it for anyone. And many, time doesn't allow me, many statements of the righteous predecessors to the effect that the Sunnah is, is beloved, is precious, is authoritative, and this is the position which every Muslim should hold. So, in your, uh, on daily basis, be careful of these individuals out there and make sure you protect yourself. And to simplify it, if you're unable to give them this whole lecture, very basic answer to any Quranite or Quranis say, listen, Tell me where in, the, where in the Quran Allah said to pray Dhuhr for Rak'at and to begin with Takbirat Al-Ihram and to end with Taslim and to recite Surah Al-Fatiha and to recite the Surah after and to say Subhan Rabbi Al-Azim Al-Rukul Find me Find me in the Quran where it says how to perform Hajj in detail and Umrah Show me in the Quran how to know the 2.5% for the Zakah and Mal and on other things Find, Give me answers If they are able to give you answers say then where are you getting your religion from? What kind of Islam are you following? Because these you don't know except from the Sunnah. So that is the actual silencing refutation for anyone who wants to reject the Quran or the, and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ask Allah azza wa jalla to enable us to live uh, according to the Quran and the Sunnah and the understanding of the righteous predecessors. Wa jazakum Allah khairan wa sallallahu alaihi wasallam ala Muhammad.